Bogota, our capital is now up to producing 178 faith per turn, which is more than any other AI in the game can even manage. And it's just, uh, I just love it. It's absolutely stupid. I, we've completely and utterly balked this game. <laughs> Hello there, ladies and gentlemen. I'm the Spiffing Brit, and today I'm playing Sid Meier's Civilization VI Gathering Storm with the latest and greatest DLC. This DLC is probably released for you right now, but for me, as I'm recording it in the past using the power of time travel, as well as an early access press copy, I'm playing this brand new DLC. Before they've even been able to release a day one patch to fix some of the slightly overpowered features. Now the lovely people over at 2K have basically sponsored me to play this game early, which honestly I'm surprised considering the amount of times I've broken Civ 6 in the past, they've been very generous to actually pay me to do it this time. Oh you lovely and kind people, don't you know what I'm going to do to this game? Now the new DLC is in a bit of a strange format, basically it's a pass based system where you pay for it and you get effectively several different updates which start from the 21st of May and go onwards into basically next year. They're adding new civilizations, new city-states, new natural wonders and new wonders to be built. But most of that's for the future. In the current and latest release what do we have here? Well we have three very important new changes which need to be addressed. Change number one, 2k decided to patch out all of the previous exploits. No longer can you do the Pantheon glitch ladies and gentlemen and no longer can you place down multiple districts. It's all gone. Rest in peace, my favourite exploit in Civ 6. But then there are two new things that have been added. There's a couple of new city-states that have been added into the game and are probably going to be slightly imbalanced and maybe have some crazy things to be discovered. And of course, most importantly, there are now two new civilizations in the game. We have Lady Six Sky of Maya. In terms of her abilities and bonuses, it's honestly nothing too special. She's a bit of a defensive turtler, but in terms of game-breaking overpoweredness, she's pretty tame. But where the crazy new deal factions really get going is when we start introducing the legendary, the one, the only, Simon Bolivar. Or Simon Bolivar, I don't know. It's got an accent-y name, so as a British person I have no chance of being able to pronounce it. But this here is Simon, of the Gran Colombia nation. Now the reason why Gran Colombia is so special is because he is so utterly ridiculously overpowered. Simon Bolivar here is downright stupidly broken. What he provides is a plus one movement to all units and also a bonus so that promoting any unit does not end that unit's turn. What this means is his units are going to go exceedingly fast across the map, his settlers can go further, meaning not only can his settlers go further, his cavalry can go further, but most importantly and most controversially game breaking, his siege weaponry can go further. Suddenly you can literally have battering rams teleporting up to the enemy's walls. This is a bit of a strange design feature, because it could be rather over Powered. But what's also quite interesting is that promoting a unit does not end that unit's turn. So what this actually means on paper is that you can promote a unit then move and attack it. In practicality what this could mean in combat is your unit has just been attacked by the enemy and it's down to half health. If we leave it there for another turn it will be dead and it has three choices. It can either run away and try and survive, stay there and try and fortify and heal up, or it can try and attack. Well now it can do all three. <laughs> what you can do is use your promotion to instantly max heal the unit and then attack with it. And of course if it's a cavalry unit that can break away from combat, well then guess what, it can also run away after attacking. Speaking of which, that brings us to their special industrial cavalry unit, the Lanero. This is a cavalry which has a low maintenance cost and a plus 4 combat strength for every adjacent Lanero. This plus 4 combat strength is pretty downright broken, <laughs> and it allows Laneros in big swarm groups to actually pack quite a lot of a punch even when they're technically outdated by modern technology. But where the Lanero is even more overpowered is with the brand new Great General which Grand Columbia has access to, a Commandite Generales. He's a special great person with a unique ability which basically provides a buff to the nation. It might be something like plus one additional trade route or it might be to immediately provide two promotions to all nearby units. But every time you expend one of these Great Generals which you get for free as soon as you go into a new era, if you have a Lanero nearby, well 
well, guess what? You've just instantly healed that unit for free. And it's got a range of like 18 tiles or something like that. So what you can do is basically pile up all of your great generals just for when you hit the industrial era. And as soon as you hit the industrial era, immediately swarm the map with increased movement speed Lineros, which have the ability to promote and attack and move. And then also have a blob of like four commandate generals running around after them who also have the ability to instantly heal them. <laughs> just absolutely love it. It's so broken. Well, Gran Colombia are probably now the most powerful nation in the game, and I love it. He also has a unique building, but honestly, what does it matter? He doesn't even need a unique building at this point. I mean, extra gold, production, food, and housing. Oh, that's lovely. What a fantastic bonus. <laughs> he definitely needed that. He was looking pretty weak otherwise. Oh, God. But surprisingly, Simon Bolivar is not actually even where I'm going to be exploiting the game today. He's a pretty damn overpowered individual, but there are other ways we can completely and utterly balk this new DLC and I absolutely love it. The new DLC has added apocalypse mode ladies and gentlemen. It adds new natural disasters, larger and more impactful versions of existing disasters and an increased chance of all natural disasters. Apocalypse mode also adds in a soothsayer unit which is literally like a tiny priesty boy who runs about the map who you can purchase with faith from literally anywhere and guess what he does? He has a bunch of charges and he could use those charges to summon death onto the enemy. I absolutely love it. It's incredibly fun. But there's also a few reasons why it's completely and utterly broken. But we're going to have to jump into a video for me to show it off. So let's go into the advanced setup of this game, make it online, make it absolutely massive and crank up those city states. We've got a fun game to play, ladies and gentlemen, and it's going to be majestic. Before we begin with the exploits, make sure you're sat back, relax, you have a nice warm cup of tea, and hey, if you're ready to see this exclusive Civ 6 content, you might have even been majestic enough to put a like on this video. Well done. And we're in the game. And as you can see, it's pretty majestic. I was playing as these lovely boys, we get our extra movement speed there, as you can see, which is absolutely lovely. Basically meaning our warrior can jump over this hill and go a little bit further. And our scouts are going to be traversing the world faster than anyone else is. Now whilst I could move my settler, I'm a bit of a lazy bugger and so that's exactly the opposite of what I'm going to do. We're just going to yeet him down right about here. We'll be fine, say the citizens of Bogota. All mountain smoke, a little right? Oh dear. Oh dear, I settled next to a volcano, didn't I? Well, beans. I'm sure it will be fine now that I'm playing on apocalypse mode. What's the worst that could happen? Now what we're going to do is we're going to rush the astrology site because trust me, it's very important. We need to get this bad boy up and running as soon as possible. Now I have an interesting combination set up, ladies and gentlemen. You see, with the brand new DLC, you can effectively cause natural disasters. You have to purchase soothsayers using faith. They cost a fair bit of money and they have a fair bit of maintenance, but they allow you to cause disasters, which is absolutely brilliant. Who doesn't want to cause disasters? The reason why they seem to be so overpowered for me, the lovely player, is because the AI doesn't care. These soothsayers are downright stupid, because you can be friendly with an enemy, go up to one of their local rivers and detonate a soothsayer, who will immediately cause a massive irreversible flood, killing about 400 million people in the city and causing absolute chaos. But the AI has no way to stop him because he acted outside of their borders, just standing on the same river. When used correctly, you can even hit multiple AI cities and the AI will still have a green happy smiley face because as far as they're aware this was a natural disaster which caused the massive catastrophic death of most of their population. It just works. But why I absolutely love the new soothsayers is most importantly because they can be comboed with the Great Bath. This is quite possibly one of the worst wonders in the game but the reason why the Great Bath is so overpowered now is because you can cause your own floods. No longer are you relying on the RNG floods of the game. No, no, no. You've got floods just caused by existence. Oh, it's brilliant. I love it. Right, now what we're going to do is we're going to use our mega warriors to effectively scout around the world, and trust me, they can scout really fast. But yes, the great buff is completely broken because of what you're able to do with it. Oh god, we just gained a free recon unit which can move four tiles. Of course we did. And we've got another one coming soon. Oh, this is lovely. Oh, we've got so many explorers now. Brilliant. Slightly too many, some would say, but it's fine. Oh, just look Look at the distance they can cover. It's only 3600 BC and we just gained a free pop. Oh, I love it. I really do. This is perfectly balanced. Absolutely perfectly balanced. We can just teleport across the map. Anyway, now that we've picked ourselves up the Hanging Gardens and we can start production on it, we're going to immediately move towards astrology so that we can get our first religion up and running. Trust me, religions are important. Oh, and we've discovered Targua. Lovely. Targua are a pretty lovely little city-state. They're nothing too special. Just plus 5% science, basically. Now, the reason why the move and promotion system is so broken is because 
I can pick up, say, one of these promotions like faster movement on woods and terrain, and now hit automate explore on the scout, and well, guess what? We've just teleported across the map, and he can now just phase through woods as if they don't exist. Now, we're going to get the great buff up and running. We need this bad boy fast. Oh, and there we go. We've discovered one of the brand new city states, the Vatican City. The Vatican City is a pretty spicy boy because whenever you activate a great person, they basically add a bunch of religious pressure to whatever city. This is good because you can basically build an aggressive forward settled city and detonate a bunch of great people in it and you'll start spreading your religion at incredible speed. Though it's nothing too game breaking. Surprisingly well balanced. I don't like it. Go, we're going to start attacking this spearman with our barbarian and we've picked up our lovely astrology. And fantastic, we can promote our warrior and attack at the same time. Now as you can guess, this is slightly broken because our warrior here, he has 59 health and if we were to attack now, that would be a minor defeat. But what we can do is, oh my, unlock battle cry, which heals our dude up to maximum and now we're no longer having a minor defeat but a major victory all in the same turn previously that's not allowed <laughs> why is this allowed game <laughs> This isn't fair. Not in the slightest. Anyway, this barb camp's now ours. Lovely stuff. And here we have it, ladies and gentlemen. Several turns later, but the great bath has been constructed. Mmm. And with the refreshing taste of Yorkshire tea gold, we're going to start seeing just how beautiful this Great Bath is. Now, why is the Great Bath so useful? Well, on all floodplains tiles, like say this one here, this one here, this one here, and this one here, every time we have ourselves a flood, the game adds food and faith to each of the affected tiles. This is completely and utterly broken, and I love it. And I'll explain why it's broken in a little bit, but for the time being, we need to get some more settlers going. And oh god, a mega colossal eruption. Oh no. That's the last thing we wanted to have happen. And we can create our first pantheon, which is lovely. Now, what I'm going to do is get the river goddess bonus for plus two amenities and plus two housing if there's a holy site district adjacent to a river. But it's also going to try and increase our faith output this game. We just don't really have any bonuses for it at the moment, which is a shame. Anyway, now that we have our holy site down and the great bath, we're also going to pick up the oracle because this is just a downright stupidly overpowered wonder. It's brilliant. It basically increases the amount of great people generated in this city, which is downright stupidly broken because by by doing that, you basically end up with a glorious situation where when combined with the right governors, you're going to be producing great people at a terrifying rate. With Pingali, you can have plus 100% great people points generated in the city, and with the Oracle, you just stack more and more modifiers on until you end up with something stupidly broken. Ah, oh, it just works. And oh, what's this? The warrior can level up and gain a plus one movement bonus. <laughs> so once again, you heal and then you attack, and that gives you a stupid bonus. But yes, of course, all of our units gain one extra movement, and for some reason can also pick up a bonus if provided it's in their tech tree to gain yet another piece of movement. Oh fantastic we've entered our first new era and so we've picked up our first Commandante General. Lovely stuff. We have just entered into a normal age but that's not going to stop the fact that we just picked him up and we now have new ways of gaining an era score. Nice. Lovely stuff. Let's do that. And here's our Commandante General. He's got a pretty unique bonus. He provides plus five combat strength and plus one movement to land units within two tiles of him. Okay so that's taken the scouts movement up to five, which is fine. <laughs> this is okay. Oh, game, please. <laughs> then he, he also has a little bonus action. What's his action? Grants plus four combat strength to cavalry class units within two tiles. Oh, okay. So we can fill up all of these neighboring tiles with cavalry units and then expend him and he's going to give them a permanent plus four attack bonus. Right, he's brilliant. We're just going to have to have him lying around. When our scout's ready to upgrade and just run across the land. There we go. Right, Jose, uh, you're just going to have to go to sleep, I'm afraid. I'm not going to need you for a very long time. Anyway, what we're now going to do is we're going to get ourselves a soothsayer. Now he costs 50 faith, but we can move him over next to one of our own rivers. And next turn he's going to do something very jazzy. There we go. We've also built ourselves the Oracle. That's a very important wonder to pick up. Now we can focus on all of the boring stuff like getting an early military out to fight these incoming barbarians. Actually, most importantly, our soothsayer is now up and running. So let's drop down a save file and hope that our soothsayer summons the right type of disaster. Now disasters can only be caused based on the tiles that they're standing on. So for example, if you detonate a soothsayer here, you're going to cause an eruption. If you detonate a soothsayer on a forest, you're going to cause a forest fire. If you detonate it on a desert, you'll cause a sandstorm. And if you detonate it on a floodplain, you're going to cause a flood. This is the unique thing when it comes to floodplains because we have the Great Bath. Now what happens is that basically the Great Flood is mitigated and so we no longer gain fertility, which is a real shame. No fertility gained on our river, meaning we can't grow food as effectively. But there's a couple of bonuses. We do gain 
main faith on these tiles. So there's one faith there and one faith there. And if we have these two tiles as well, that's a further two faith every time there's a flood. What this means is we can artificially cause floods whenever we like. And every time we do cause floods, we grant ourselves free faith because that just makes perfect sense, doesn't it? Oh my goodness. And our chariots spawn in with five movement because they've got the nearby general, allowing them to teleport across the map and just snipe out any enemy units. This is utterly glorious. Oh, and we can recruit our great prophet. Incredible. This is exactly what we needed. And of course, we can immediately teleport him over to his holy site and we can get ourselves a faith started, which is absolutely perfect. Ah, oh, right. There we go. We've started our brand new own religion, which is perfect. And this entire religion is just going to be dedicated to trying to get as many faith points as possible. Mostly so that we can just summon natural disasters onto either ourselves to gain bonuses or to the enemy so as to destroy their cities. And so our religion of the apocalypse is now founded. We're going to pick up divine inspiration so that we get plus four faith for each wonder that we build, which is lovely. And we're going to pick up the bonus of plus two faith for every city following this religion in other civilizations and city-states. Basically a religion entirely dedicated to faith production, because faith gives us magic people of the ability to flood just about anything. Anyway, with all of these lovely bonuses, we have a bunch of extra faith so that we can buy even more soothsayers if necessary, or we can actually buy ourselves our first missionary, a missionary of the apocalypse who can go about spreading the lovely words. And we can even pick up ourselves our first government. We're going to go for classical republics, mostly so that we can increase the generation of great person points, which we're going to be pumping out at a stupid rate. Oh my goodness, this is an incredible opportunity. I love this. Um, apparently there's an ongoing competition of appeasing the gods. Basically, we're now competing to the highest score of sacrificing units next to volcanoes using soothsayers. If we win, we get a free soothsayer unit, but we also gain more faith per turn and also free random promotions for soothsayer units. So it's time to go march off our army straight towards our nearest volcano and get sacrificing. My goodness, sacrifice adjacent unit. I love it. Why is this not a feature? more games. This is incredible. All right, so our chariot wanders next to the volcano and we need to get ourselves up into first place. We've got eight turns remaining, so let's sacrifice that chariot. Da 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 da. Perfect. Oh, and fantastic. We're in the lead with 28. This is exactly what I wanted to have. And yes, it would seem we're going to win the appease the gods task very happily. Good stuff. It's exactly what I wanted to see. And yes, there we go. You are in first place. You win. I've earned the gold tier rewards, which involve a free soothsayer and some promotion. I'm not sure what they are. A free random promotion to all future soothsayer units. Who knows what it could be? So we get ourselves a free soothsayer unit, which now has the plus one charge. Adjacent enemy cities are also automatically besieged. Ah, oh, the plague bear upgrade. This one, however, also has the plague bear upgrade. Okay, so basically all of our soothsayers now have one extra charge. Brilliant. So I'm just now going to detonate this soothsayer next to our city, cause a flood, which is going to get immediately mitigated, of course. You know, we might as well buy up the other floodplain tile, which now has two extra faith on it. So we've now got six faith gathered just from these flood tiles alone. And then lo and behold, we're able to move over yet another soothsayer and we're going to do the same. And what's this? Another great scientist because we just keep earning them so quickly. Lovely. Oh, and ladies and gentlemen, I've been chatting to Simon Bolivar and guess what? He's got one limited time offer for you, ladies and gentlemen. For the first 6,666 people who liked the video, guess what? Simon Bolivar has said they won't be sacrificed to the angry volcano spirits in the next round of the soothsayer competition. Everyone else, however, is fair game for the fiery oblivion. Ah, oh, Pingala, you are absolutely insane. I know I haven't got many cities up, and this is by no means the most efficient way of playing this game, but this is just a demonstration of how stupidly overpowered Gran Colombia, when paired with other brand new features, can be. Anyway, let's cause even more natural disasters. So, one more. Whoa, bam. And let's cause yet another one. Ah, lovely stuff. And now if we look at those tiles, mmm, faith. <laughs> Lots of lovely faith. Who would have guessed that continuous apocalyptic levels of flooding would cause faith to appear in an empire. Let's cause yet another disaster. Lovely stuff. And now all of these provinces are up to five faith each. Oh my goodness. <laughs> so there is 15 faith just on these provinces here. 15 faith is a pretty decent faith output for a city. All right, and let's cause yet another disaster. So we've caused six disasters here on our lovely floodplain. And whilst we don't gain any fertility from this, we now have far too much faith. Okay. Yep, 37 faith per turn. We can buy another soothsayer. And you know what? Might as well. <laughs> Oh, I love soothsayers, they're brilliant. All right, it's time for us to cause more floods as well. There we go, let's have another one. Brilliant stuff, just keep on increasing those faith. Let's cause yet another 
disaster. Oh, it's perfect. I love the apocalypse, I really do. And fantastic, we've built ourselves Petra to make our desert tiles just a little bit more valuable to actually hold on to, so that this city is even more overpowered. You know what, I think it's time for us to get more settlers up and running, because we really don't have that many cities. But we do have a lot of natural disasters. Oh, I love them. So yes, now we're up to nine faith on each of these tiles. <laughs> this is stupid, it's so stupid, because I can now purchase with faith yet another soothsayer. The soothsayer only goes up, okay, for each soothsayer you have by 50 faith so we can just buy a bunch of missionaries and even more soothsayers i love it this game is balked oh i'm fantastic we've entered into the medieval era which has granted us yet another golden age lovely oh fantastic and with that we get a brand new generale specialis or whatever he is who once again provides plus five combat as well as one extra land movement to all nearby units now this guy's special ability is to instantly create the strongest land combat unit you can build with one promotion level and this unit has no resource maintenance cost now what you can do is use this guy immediately to basically get a free unit or you can save him for when you can build a giant death robot and then you've suddenly just been handed a free giant death robot with no maintenance oh that's um that's unfair isn't it game. It's very unfair. Anyway, we're in a golden age, which is brilliant. Oh, plus two movement for all builders. May purchase civilian units with faith. Oh, and purchases with faith and gold are 30% cheaper. Don't mind if I do. Lovely stuff. Now we can start putting some of that faith to good use, like pumping out a bunch of builders. Except these builders could move far. Too far. Oh, and we've got our great scientist Hildegard of Bingen. Lovely stuff. She's brilliant. I think the Hunza city-state here is actually new. Don't recognize it. It basically provides plus one gold for every five tiles your trade routes have to travel which is pretty good i'd imagine like some late game coastal trade routes are going to be absolutely insane with that bad boy anyway let's cause yet another disaster for more faith brilliant yet another flood and what does this mean oh well it means these tiles are now producing 12 faith each this is um it's it's a unique feature it's different it's very different why is this allowed in the game i love it i absolutely love it <laughs> You can basically pick up this DLC as well. I'm pretty sure I've had to include a link in the uh, description, which you can pick up, no pressure though. All right, so here's our builder with five movements. So he's just going to teleport across the map to the cotton here and go, boop, now we're gonna have a plantation. Lovely stuff. Oh, and of course we need to get ourselves a trade route going. So let's get one going to our second city over here and choose our research, lovely. We'll go for construction. And now we need to start buying more things with our faith, including an apostle so we can improve our religion and a builder so that we can improve all of our tiles because we really need to start doing that. So we've started converting enemy cities and the joyous, majestic conversion of the apocalypse is beginning. Right, we're going to also now be able to evangelize our belief thanks to our brand new apostle. And we can immediately start upgrading our brand new city and making it jazzy. With something like a harbor. Oh, lovely. Anyway, Mr. Builder Friend, you can build a farm as well. We can just get all of these tiles worked so they provide stupid amounts of faith and decent quantities of food. That would be brilliant. But it's time to evangelize our belief and make it even more powerful. All right, we're going to go for Holy Order, make it so that missionaries and apostles are cheaper to buy. Does it affect soothsayers? It does not. What a shame, but you have to check these things. And there we go with our final faith boost. We're going to pick up mosques so that our missionaries and apostles gain plus one spread so that if we wanted to go for a religious victory, we easily could. And we've got ourselves yet another soothsayer, which of course is going to cause even more disasters because we might as well. And we've got so much faith lying around. Might as well get these citizens working these tiles. Now that they provide 13 faith each, which is downright stupid. Anyway, let's cause yet a yet another soothsayer disaster because we can. <sighs> Welcome back ladies and gentlemen, it's turn 79, it's 820 AD and things are going quite good in our empire. We're researching some divine right and we're building the Kilwa Kisiwani. This is the most important wonder of any game ever. You might be wondering why, well it's because it gives you free envoys, but most importantly if you're a suzerain of a city-state you gain a plus 15% boost from that city-state and if you're a suzerain of two of those city-state types you receive an extra plus 15% boost. If we're the suzerain of two science city states, we get a plus 30% boost in say the plus two science to our capital. It's a really nice little wonder to have and it really does add up. But most importantly we're getting our empire up and running and our faith production is at an all time high. Things are looking great. Of course we're going to get a few more cities built over here on this brand newly discovered continent because we might as well. And also settlers are basically free to purchase with faith now so I can have as many of them as I like. Oh my goodness there's a category 4 hurricane off of our coastline 
line. Oh, good God. Okay, that's a spooky boy, actually. Hopefully our settler's going to be able to dodge that. If they can't, fair dues. <laughs> They're dead. So be it. Anyway, let's also get our brand new city settled down over here. Lovely stuff. And immediately we're going to cheese against the AI and buy up all of the luxury resources around this sieve. I'm sorry, I need them, not you. And oh my goodness, getting a new city up and running is so expensive and difficult. It takes ages to build a builder. Oh wait, you can just buy it with faith. Ah, much better. <laughs> That's how you get all of your new cities up and running. Oh my goodness, the Category 5 hurricane is going for our lands. It is not looking good. <laughs> There's going to be many casualties as soon as it hits the city, but oh well. Oh no, and now we've had a crippling blizzard. Oh, beans. That's not good. Uh, it turns out the apocalypse is great, but also simultaneously can just kill you. Oh no. <laughs> Who could have guessed that living in the apocalypse could have been so dangerous to an empire? Anyway, we've got some spare faith lying around, so we might as well buy ourselves yet another soothsayer and trigger ourselves some more river damage. Right, chaotic river damage. Yes, mitigate that flood. And yes, we're up to now 16 faith per each of these tiles, meaning this city is outputting 59 faith in total, although we could add even more if we really wanted. Oh, fantastic. It's one turn later. It's now 1060 AD and we can cause yet another disaster for more faithy points. Oh, I love it. And there we go. Fantastic. We built the Kilwa Kisiwania, uh, which is lovely. It's pushed us over into a golden age, but most importantly, it gives us a bunch of bonuses for each city-state we're a suzerain of. How many city-states are we a suzerain of? Zero. <laughs> <laughs> That's something we'll have to fix. Anyway, we'll cause yet another flood, which immediately gets mitigated, which is lovely. And now if we actually manage our citizens and say we want to, instead of focusing on production, focus on faith, well, now our faith production is up to 105 in one city. This is absolutely perfect. Now all I have to do is build the Kotaku'uni, uh, which is basically a wonder which provides plus 20 faith in the city and get it slapped down right here to increase our faith production. All right, now we're actually able to settle our first ever colonial settlement this is a fantastic city because it's in the middle of technically bloody nowhere across the sea from us, but it's in a prime position to be upgraded. And one of the reasons I love soothsayers so much is that they are absolutely stupidly overpowered in terms of combat. So what you can do with a soothsayer is run them into enemy cities and then immediately start summoning meteors onto them, which is absolutely lovely. But another thing you can do in this game when you're playing apocalypse mode is to deliberately cause copious amounts of CO2, because the more CO2 is in the atmosphere, for some reason, the more massive mega meteorites come down and attack cities. And as you can guess, that's um, pretty crazy, <laughs> because having more meteors slamming down continuously in onto enemy cities is lovely and powerful, especially if you have some bonuses to protect you from it. Anyway, we've just entered the Renaissance era. Naturally, it's golden era time. Oh, we're so good. What's that? Basically, everyone else is in a dark age, excluding America and Japan. Perfect. Oh, and you know exactly what we need to do. Another age of monumentality so that we get cheaper builders and settlers. Oh, lovely stuff. This is just perfect, isn't it? And of course, we can now pick up gunpowder. Lovely. Let's get our soothsayer and start causing even more disasters. Oh, that means we've got a new great general as well. What's his special ability? All land units within two tiles regain all movement and attack capability. What? It's a double attack great general. <sighs> Hang on a second. Imagine you're fighting someone and then he just goes, hmm, okay, you've been winning this combat. Well, now all of my units can move and attack again for a second time this time. <laughs> That's not fair, game. <laughs> That's not okay. You can't do that. Oh, goodness. Well, it's not like we can stop you. Now, after some very strange flood mitigation, all of our floodplains tiles are now up to 21 faith each, um, which is not natural at all. Uh, there is nothing about this which is a natural and fair game of Civ. This is completely unfair. We have the most science and we by far have the most faith per turn. This is absolutely stupid. We are basically in a prime position where if we wanted to take over the entire world with our faith, we could. Oh, I love it. And there we go. Fantastic. We've picked up the reformed church, meaning we can now switch our government over to theocracy. Lovely stuff. A theocratic government is extra special because it allows us to get cheaper faith per Purchases. Oh, this is some lovely stuff. So our new apostle, oh, what do they get? Can spread religion two extra times or triple strength in other civilizations? Oh, I love that. Right, let's send you straight to the front lines. We're going to aggressively change the religion of all of our opponents. They won't even have a say. And if they do have a say, we're going to send over religious dudes to cause massive floods. That'll teach them for having different opinions. And there we go. We've built the 
Kotaku in. It's not a particularly fantastic wonder, but as I said, that plus 20% extra faith production is very useful indeed. It's also given us a bunch of warrior monks, which are useful, maybe? I don't know. I don't think so. We're mostly just going to have them sit AFK in our borders to make it look like we have a much stronger military than we actually do. Oh my goodness, yes. A yet another soothsayer event. Appease the gods. Just immediately spam sacrifice units next to a volcano. Once again, there's one next to a capital. And if we get everything correct, we'll get a free random promotion for all future soothsayer units, which will stack on top of our existing one. Okay, lovely. So it's time for us to line up the warrior monks next to the volcano, because warrior monks have a melee strength of 35, making them very valuable sacrifices. All right, go stand by. And have we got enough to purchase ourselves a soothsayer? Yes, we do, because we're now a theocracy. Soothsayers have gone down from where I think they should have been, which is around about 400 faith points at this point, and instead they are down to 340, because we're in a golden age and we're a theocracy. So our soothsayers are even more powerful. Now all we need to make sure we do is sacrifice as many of these units as feasibly possible. Oh, and also it's time to get converting. The apocalypse waits for no one. All right, it's time for the great sacrificing to begin and sacrifice adjacent unit. Bam. And we'll immediately move another one in. And, oh, we have to wait a turn before we can sacrifice another unit. What's the strongest unit we can produce? Musketman with a melee strength of 55. Okay. All right, we need to get ourselves a couple of those bad boys. Maybe we could do with another soothsayer, actually, so that we could sacrifice two people per turn. That's where we're going to be getting our points from. Oh my goodness, a mega colossal eruption has started, and it has uh, fertilized four tiles, but damaged five and killed three people. A massive loss for our capital, but it matters little because beautiful songs are sung as we've <laughs> apparently done a fear to Figgy. Okay, great. We did a fear to Figgy, even though so many people in our capital city died. Oh god, right? Soothsayer sacrifice. It's not like these units are going to last very long anyway. And let's hire yet another soothsayer. Good stuff. How's the appeasement going? We're in second place. Okay, we need to up that. Get more sacrifices going. We're going to also need some more stronger units. And sure, we could repair all of our holy sites and government plazas. But that's redundant. What we need at this point in time are musketmen, which we can't make. Beans. <laughs> Instead, we're going to have to make horse dudes. Yes, sacrifice horse dudes to the flame. Right, anyway, it's time for yet another sacrifice. So we'll sacrifice that unit and we'll sacrifice yet another adjacent unit. Our appeasement of the gods has put us in the lead and I'm pretty sure there's no way we can lose from this point on. Anyway, there we go. We've been spreading some lovely faith about. The apocalypse is now deeply rooted in Japan. Oh, great. Two fantastic proposals. Give Simon Bolivar stuff or take Simon Bolivar's religion away. <laughs> okay, well, I'm going to downvote the take my religion away because I quite like my religion. All right, make sure to vote for the good ones beans. They passed both of them. Ah, <sighs> bugger. So now we have three active events all going on at the same time. Luckily I'm leading the appeasement of the gods with two more sacrifices. This should put us very comfortably into the lead now. Now, we've finished the Appease the Gods, uh, ladies and gentlemen, which is something that finally happened, but most importantly, finishing the Appease the Gods has granted us another bonus. Not only did we get a free Soothsayer unit, our Soothsayers got an extra bonus. Not only do they get the plus one charge from being a Plague Bearer, they now also are Zealots, which give them plus two charges. So we now have five charges on each Soothsayer, meaning each Soothsayer can just keep on adding faith to each of these tiles. This tile here provides 25 faith. So does this one, and so does this one, and so would this one if we actually had access to it. This is stupid, and I love it. Oh, this game, what have I done to you? This is so stupid. It makes no sense, but I love it. Absolutely do. I mean, there's so many wars going on, actually. We don't have to worry about any of them because of how much score we have. The AI is terrified of us. So yes, we're just going to chain cause massive floods in our lovely city to just add more and more lovely modifiers. And there we go. Basically, each turn we cause three non-existent mega floods to decimate our city. But of course, we see none of them. And that's now added 30 faith to each of these tiles. Oh, this is incredible. I'm just buying more soothsayers and we're adding more faith to each of these provinces. Bogota, our capital is now up to producing 178 faith per turn, which is more than any other AI in the game can even manage. And it's just, uh, I just love it. It's absolutely stupid. I we've completely and utterly balked this game. Once again, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank today's sponsors uh, by paying to have me do this. It's very generous of you. Very generous. Uh, all of these floods which aren't happening. 
It's beautiful. Apparently, Grand Columbia has made history. The armies of jealous civilizations failed to stop our people. The religious emergency dissolves. <gasps> Fantastic, we did it. We won the religious emergency. Ah, lovely. So that means we basically almost instant convert almost all nearby cities. Oh, yes, look at this. All right, it's time for us to remove the remainder of any religion. Now, allow me to explain why the Glorious Soothsayer unit is so overpowered. Well, what we're able to do is we're able to effectively farm pain to enemy cities. Over here, we have a city-state of Targua, which, I mean, we've sunk a couple of envoys into, but we have no way of gaining control of because of some cheeky Japanese person who sunk five into it. So what we can do is we can send our lovely soothsayer all the way down south. And then what our lovely friend over there is going to be able to do is he's going to be able to detonate this volcano every single turn, which will technically kill the neighboring city-state, but also create a bit of fun. Ah, now we've actually researched economics, we can build our own special buildings, these lovely plantation-y boys, which give us some era score, but also upgrade nearby luxuries. Lovely stuff. But most importantly, I'm now able to show off my legendary soothsaying abilities by destroying the local city-state of Targua by just hitting cause disaster. This causes a mega colossal eruption which damages five tiles and kills one pop. Lovely stuff. And immediately next turn I can do the same. So if you want to actually go to war with a city, instead of having to besiege it, you can just set a nearby volcano on fire and waltz on in. Welcome back ladies and gentlemen. Our progress has been absolutely astounding. We are by far the most powerful empire in existence. Our ability to control the world as is if God worshipped he himself and bestowed us with divine powers. And these powers grant us the ability to set fire to anything, flood anything, and explode just about anything. All with just the click of our fingers and 500 faith points. Ah, Targua, you're just starting to repair from that previous volcano disaster. Well, now there's another one! Mega colossal eruption, five people dead. You're now down to free pop. Oh, this is just bullying. It really is. Oh, you poor guys. You poor, poor sausages. I love it. Yes, basically we can just mess about with any civilization. You know what, let's go mess up Japan, because we can. Oh god, another mega colossal eruption in our capital city. Beans. Well, it's improved five tiles, damaged five, and killed two pop. You know, that's fine. And also, the AI is still making very strange and wacky gestures in terms of trading, because for some reason, they completely undervalue pieces of great work. I've literally had the AI offer me eight gold for a single great work in this game, which is um, certainly not what it's worth. And oh my goodness, a mega colossal eruption has happened. Yet another one. Oh, the capital just keeps getting set on fire. Well, the good news is it keeps adding production and food to the local tiles, but at the same time, I think I'd prefer it if it just behaved for a little while. Anyway, once again, we're now in the industrial era, and naturally, we hit a golden era. Of course we did. This is going to allow us to pick up the heartbeat of steam bonus, as well as, oh, oh and there we go. We've also picked up ourselves yet another legendary bonus, Commandante Generality. This one is a money-making dude. Its passive ability is the same as all of the others, but most importantly, he provides one promotion level to all nearby military units, which of course can be used on the same turn as moving, but most importantly, for any units in this radius, he gains 50% of their gold production, which is, um, that, that's pretty useful, I've got to be honest. You build up a massive army, slap him down in the middle, and just before you send them off to combat, you get about four grand. What a lovely feature. I suppose you could also surround him in giant death robots and get 1,500 a pop. Oh, this game. Anyway, as you can guess, this game is completely and utterly broken from here on out. Books are at 177 science, and we're just going to start snowballing. Equally, it's important to remember that with the way the new soothsayers work, not only can you farm them to make your city stupidly overpowered so that you have, say, tiles in your capital which produce 45 faith each, you can also use these soothsayers for aggressive reasons in attacking enemy cities like, say, in Targua, where the AI is not actually aware of what you're doing and so it doesn't mind the fact that you're attacking. We could take the soothsayer down to here, burst the banks of the river, and suddenly Fukuoka over here is now getting hit by great floods and losing population, but the AI will not count it against me because it's a natural disaster beyond anyone's control. So even though they're technically really upset with me now, I could go over to a, a nation who is friendly with me and just repeatedly volcano their capital city and they'd still be absolutely loving my existence. They'd think I'm the friendliest person around. So yes, this game is perfectly balanced and it features no exploits whatsoever. Anyway, I've been the Spiffing Brit. This has been an absolutely brilliant first look at the upcoming Civ 6 DLC, which if you want to check out, there'll be a link in the description. I'm not allowed to review it at all. In fact, I'm not even sure if I'm allowed to say I had fun, but I had fun. This was a good game of Civ, and I'm excited to see what kind of wacky strategies I can pull off when playing with friends later. You know, if you're new here, feel free to subscribe, because at the end of the day, only 50% of my audience is actually subscribed. I know, who could imagine such a statistic to be true, but it is. If you enjoyed today's video, you can give it a like. My goodness, what a majestic thing.
thing to do. And as always, a massive thank you to each and every one of my majestic patrons who makes all of these videos all the more possible. Seriously, thank you very much. These are some wacky times and all of you who support the channel in various different ways of either commenting, just being a part of the Discord or whatever, it really does help out. Thank you very much. And if you sat there wondering what video you'd like to watch next, well, look no further than the ones I've chosen for you on screen. Trust me, you're going to love them if you enjoyed today's video. Anyway, I'll see each and every one of you in the next one. Have an absolutely lovely day and goodbye for now.